Welcome to this episode of Ed Circuit Author Chats. I'm really excited to have a chance today to speak with a couple of social studies teachers. I think for the first time in our series, John Bassett is the 10th grade world history teacher at Match Public Charter School in Boston. And Gary Shipman is the social studies curriculum coordinator in Brookline High School. And uh, these two have worked together for, I think, the better part of two decades. And uh, together they just released their new book, From Story to Judgment, The Four Question Method for Teaching and Learning Social Studies. And it's based on the four question method, which John and Gary developed together. And it really allows teachers and students to identify and practice the key thinking skills in history and the social sciences. So we're going to chat a lot about that today. John and Gary, welcome to Author Chats. Thanks, happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. So uh, guys, uh, what happened? Uh, so that's, <laughs> that's the first question of your four questions. And, you know, I want to use it here as, a, as an intro here. Number one, please talk us through a little bit about what that question refers to uh, in your approach, but also tell the listeners what happened with respect to your collaboration. What led to your work together? What led you to write this book? Well, so thanks, Ross, for, uh, for queuing that up so nicely. Yeah, we always start our study of history and social studies with a story. When we start with question one, we got to know what happened before we can do some deeper thinking about it. Um, and it's actually a pretty funny story about how we started collaborating. You know, Gary was a, a political theorist at UC San Diego. And when he realized he probably wasn't going to get tenure out there, he chucked it all and came home east. Um, moved in with his wife's family in their in their uh, home in Brookline, and then he applied for uh, secondary school teaching jobs. He got one interview, and that was at Newton North, where I was the department chair. Um, and we had just uh, passed a big tax override in our town, so we had plenty of money. Um, and um, I got to hire four history teachers, and Gary was number four. Uh, and we figured this guy's either going to be terrific or he's going to be terrible. And of course, he turned out to be terrific. But the the funny part of the story is that um, after I hired him and before the school year started, he said, uh, well, I'd like to take you out for a beer. I was like, sure. So we go out for a beer in the summer and he sits me down. It's like, so what do we teach in history and why do we do that? Um, and then we just started basically arguing um, from there. And uh, I have said there are some important stories that uh, kids needed to know about where we live and how it relates to other places. And Gary told me that stories were boring and kids didn't need to know them. They just needed to know um, underlying principles. And I said that no underlying principles were boring. And we went at it for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years and basically disputed our way to the four question method. And I think it's been really productive. Gary, you want to correct me on that? Yeah, well, so my job, Ross, is to usually come in and correct John. So John was right about that important first question. So my my training was not in history. I have not taken a history course since high school, which was back in the 1970s, and didn't particularly like it then. I was a math science kid. I went to college and discovered political theory, which for me was a lot like geometry, only about human topics. And I ended up. I ended up in academia. I did all that stuff, and that the, the rest of what John said is true. I figured out uh, as a college professor that I actually like teaching, and it turns out that high schools do more of it more seriously than colleges. In any case, I ended up at Newton North. John was right about stories, but I was right about the concepts and principles. So the problem in a lot of history classes, and and we've spent tons of time observing them and teaching them and misteaching them ourselves. The problem in a lot of history classes is that people lose the thread of the story. Uh, kids are most engaged when they have that anticipation that what happened next. So what happened is it stands for family of questions, right? It's what happened. There's a Yiddish version, which is what happened? I can hear my grandmother in my head, right? What happened here? But what happened next builds anticipation. It keeps kids on the hook. So one common mistake is people don't tell the story. And I have to learn this the hard way. That if you don't start there, kids don't know what you're doing. Um, but I was also right. If you leave it there, we have great stories. That's great. Well, you know what? Pixar is actually better at that. We can seed our whole curriculum to Pixar and let them tell the stories. But there's much more to it than that. We do teach, need to teach kids how to do things like interpret complex, difficult documents from other times and places. We do have to teach them how to understand and recognize patterns, maybe explain why things happen when where they do. And ultimately, we have to teach them how to be citizens and to make judgments based on knowledge and true belief and not 
Pixar. So we came to consensus after many years of argument that indeed we need to start with question one. John was right about that. But as he and I both like to say, uh, I was right about everything else. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> I'm sure he likes to yeah. say that. Yeah. It's true. It's true. Basically, <laughs> when, whenever we're debating something interesting, I always say, look, it starts out with Gary putting forward a premise and he's saying, I don't think so. And then I take anywhere from six to, you know, 36 weeks to puzzle it over and come back and say, yeah, you know, you were right about that. So. All right. So, so you said the second question of these four is what were they thinking? Right. And I think, you know, even your, your response to the first question of this interview has, uh, largely followed along that thread to say, okay, in real time, we were developing this, we were engaging in debate with one another. Um, you know, you describe yourselves as having argued over this for the past two decades, but you know, the, that those discussions and debates really led to, I'm sure, like a refinement of this approach. Let's talk through that a little more. One, you know, the what were they thinking, of course, is about putting ourselves in the, in the shoes of uh, people in the times in which they were engaging with things and what was going through their mind and what's what's not on the page, right? What a, if we were there with them, how would we be understanding and evaluating those actions? But also with, with the two of you and you're developing this approach, um, you know, I think there's probably a number of things that you've each convinced one another of over the time, right? Coming from different perspectives, different backgrounds and saying, uh, you know, something that's so critical because we see this time and again where um you know the the shortcomings of uh you know not only group think necessarily but we put together this team of five people to, to work on this problem and all five people have exactly the same background <laughs> and so there's just all these blind spots and, you know it's evident just from the two of you having come from different points of view that there are things that one or the other if you did it by yourself you wouldn't have come up with or if you just found somebody else that was just like you you would have only had half an approach here tell me a bit about that tell me about you know one you know why that concept of understanding what were they thinking is uh, that important next step to kind of really build on what happened but also how that applied to what the two of you were thinking when you were, you know, working on refining this approach. I'm actually going to answer those questions in reverse order and, and say that, so, you know, we like to say that if it were just me, this book would have come out 15 years ago and it would have been bad. <laughs> and if it were just Gary, there'd be no website and no book, um, but there'd be a lot of really good ideas. Um, and so, you know, we complement each other um, in the skills we bring, but you're right. We also, we, we bring very sort of different intellectual approaches. You know, I've always been a history guy. I loved history since I was in middle school, knew I wanted to be a history teacher starting in like eighth or ninth grade. And so, you know, that was my training, got a BA in history, got an MAT in teaching history and eventually a EDD in curriculum and teaching. But my focus was always, I was a history guy. And, you know, Gary told the truth. He hasn't taken a history course since high school, except for one cross-listed course in his, in his PhD program at Michigan. So, you know, I think that those two approaches, you know, have each honed each other. And what we've got is kind of what we've ended up with is, is kind of a, a synthesis of the two approaches in a way that's been really productive. Back to your, then the, the first part of your question is how does question two work? You know, we always start our teaching and learning of history with, with a story, but there are always some interesting people in that story who made interesting decisions. And these might have been large groups of ordinary people. These might have been particular individuals, but there are points in the story where they do things that, um, that are either important or puzzling to us or seem strange or, you know, a decision point that is a turning point in the story. And we want to pause there and really try to get into the heads of these people from the past. And we, and we ask, so that's where we ask, what were they thinking? And the, the focus of this, you, you really have to slow down and do a deep dive. And you know, we write in the book about historical empathy, and that's the idea of understanding people in the past on their own terms. You know, people generally act in ways that make sense to them. 
So if we see things that don't seem to make sense to us or are puzzling to us or seem morally reprehensible or, you know, that's a great opportunity for us to say, hmm, I don't think I really understand this person on their own terms. And how can we slow down our thinking and really try to dive in and get into their heads? And so that's where the, the heavy lifting of, of question two comes. Now, the other, the other thing we do with question two is the, the, the other catchphrase we have that would be on a t-shirt if we had t-shirts is the author concept. And it's completely related to historical empathy. Historical empathy is the goal. If you go through this interpretive process, you may not agree, you may find them more reprehensible, but you're inside, which is a very different place to be. The author concept is the idea that people are making choices. Uh, story conveys some of this. These are real people doing real things. It's kind of exciting and dramatic, the way you want to identify with Pixar protagonist. But it's not until kids really try to dig in through meaningful artifacts and through consideration of those artifacts in, in a context. It's not until you do interpretation with them for real that they realize, wow, they didn't have to do that. They could have done something else. They were people like me confronting choices. And even on the page, they didn't have to say things that way. They could have used different words, different tone, different medium, addressed a different audience. All of that starts to become real for kids when you walk them through that process of, so Patrick Henry says, give me liberty or give me death. In the Virginia houses of Burgesses, I think, right? What, what, was he, what was he thinking? Why do you say that? Why do you say that in that way? How provocative did he think it was? What kind of guy was he? What, you know, like you start to enter the story in a deep way. You may like him more, you may like him less. It's not, that's not the immediate concern. We'll get to that. But what you're doing is you're starting to see this is a person. And for our kids, you know, we, we make them go to school for an awful long time before they, we let them do anything particularly meaningful or significant. But they're training for that. And they have to understand they're not the first to face choices. And the more times they interact with real people in history who are making choices, the better equipped they'll be. The more the knowledge base will be relevant to whatever they have to figure out. Who do I vote for? Do I run for you know, town council? Do I lead a movement? Do I participate in a revolution? Whatever it is, do I post on Facebook? Other damaging things like that. They have to understand choices. And I, I think one thing also that, you know, Gary sort of made clear there is that question two becomes live when we situate it in the story, right? We, we you know, oftentimes as history teachers, we know we're supposed to read primary documents. Oh, okay. Yeah, but why? <laughs> Why are we reading primary documents? So if you start with question one and establish a story, and then there's an interesting person or people in that story who did some interesting things, okay, now we're going to get into some documents to try to understand their thinking. Oh, now I know why I'm doing that. Why do I need to learn the skill of close reading? Why do I care about contextualization? Well, in our field, those skills are often just put out there as things kids should do. But what we've sort of figured out is, no, no, it works a lot better if everyone in the room knows why those skills are important. Right. And, and uh, you know, not to equate the importance of understanding major historical events with uh, something like popular media, but you can see how that thought process goes into the analysis of things like, you know, music, like understanding, okay, you know, why was what the Beatles were doing in the 60s impressive if it sounds, you know, it doesn't sound that different from now, but they, they or, you know, a, a movie from the 70s. Well, this is all cliched. Well, but it wasn't then, right? They, <laughs> these were the first people to do that. And now it's been ripped off so many times. But even just in small slices like that, right. thinking about, okay, th this was a certain time and place. And the things that were happening there were ahead of their time at that time. They're no longer oh, are because we, you know, a lot has happened since then, but it, you know, it really helps you to understand, especially if you look back way before student was born, way before anybody that they know was born right, to think about, okay, I, what was happening back then? Because it might, it, what seems obvious now was not back then. Yeah. Yeah. And anything that's authored, whether it's a movie, a song, anything that's authored can be interpreted. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, so that just kind of keeps us rolling. And this is the sort of the efficiency uh, and, and elegance of this method. But, you know, the third question, why then and there? And this is about understanding the context in which people were acting. And it helps to explain, in your words, a change with a change and a difference with a difference. 
tell me about that. I, I, I like that a lot, uh, you know, and I think that kind of gives us you know, kind of a good understanding of like really part of the purpose of what we're trying to do here and, and how we're trying to really understand what was happening. So just even that last part, a change with a change, a difference with a difference kind of, can you uh, expound on that? Yeah, Gary invented that. We actually love talking about question three because it's the most complicated and abstract of the questions. And I actually spent 18 months telling Gary that uh, that it didn't exist, that there was no such thing as question three. Um, so I'm, I am very, very sympathetic to history teachers and students who, who struggle to understand question three. Um, and essentially what question three asks us to do is, is to back out of the story and look at underlying um, conditions and context that might explain why it happened when and where it did. And, you know, my argument with Gary was that, well, look, once we know what happened and once we know what the people who made that story happen were thinking, we're done. We've explained it. Right. And um, Gary kept telling me, no, no, John, there's there's something else that's at work here. Um, and the key to understanding that something else is that question three is always comparative. You're always comparing either two different places or two different times in the same place. And that's where um, Gary coined this, you know, this brilliant, this brilliant phrase, explain a change with a change and a difference with a difference. So, you know, let's just take the American Revolution. Right? American Revolution happens in 1776, the 13 colonies rebel, they get their independence. Well, Canada was also a British colony. It didn't rebel at the same time. Right. Why not? And it's very easy to fall into that. Well, why not? Well, because the Canadians weren't as angry as their uh, colleagues to the their co colonial colleagues to the south. Well, yes, that's true. That's what they were thinking. They were not as angry. But let's look at what are the underlying conditions. What underlying context might explain why it is that a higher percentage of the thirteen you know Atlantic col colonists were really mad than a percentage of Canadian colonists. What's different about Canada and the 13 colonies? And so this is sort of the, the underlying, it, it's the comparative element that's key. Our other phrase there is factors, not actors. And that helps us to get away from the individuals and the people involved in the story as we do in questions one and two. We right. back out and we're looking for conditions. Gary's leaning in, looking like he wants to say something. Here. Oh, so I, I had a, I, I saw, I saw a class yesterday, uh, a brilliant colleague uh, who did the classic mistaken move, which historians are trained for, by the way. Remember, I'm a political scientist, and for context, I was the humanities guy in a very scientific department. History, as a profession, as I understand it, is what's left after the Enlightenment struck and took the study of humans away from them. It all became political science, ec economics, sociology, and so on. Historians are who are left telling stories. So question three is an attempt to weave scientific kinds of thinking back into the study of humans with moderation, with lots of skepticism. So um, I'm in a class. And the teacher asks, why, why did uh, the Europeans explode out into the new world at the time they did? You no know, colonization, the Spanish and the British and the Dutch were there and all that. And kid says, Christianity. And I think to myself, because I've trained myself in question three, for how long were the Europeans Christian? And the answer is for a very long time. But the question is, when did they colonize? And the answer is starting in the 15th century through the 18th century, but really, you know, 15th, 16th centuries, the Spanish are out there making a big empire, gets everyone piled up. So Christianity is what we call a constant. It's always there. Anyway, the discussion continues, and then we learn about gold, God, and glory. That the people who colonized wanted those three things, but everybody always wants those three things. John has ultimate values. And he pursues them. John likes money, and John wants to be well regarded by his peers. So what gold, God, and glory are are answers to question two. What were the conquistadores thinking when they went? They'd like all these things. It doesn't answer the question, why did they go then and not 100 years before, 100 years later? Why the Spaniards and not the Hungarians? Or the Chinese, who are well equipped to do so? 
So when John says it's comparative thinking, it's totally comparative thinking. It's also an attempt to take the methods of science, which really are the methods of comparison. If I give you a Pfizer shot, Ross, I know that you are better protected against the COVID virus. I know that by comparing you to a control group that doesn't get the shot. Unfortunately, we're conducting a national experiment right now. Where we're proving this over and over again. But it's the same logic just applied to human affairs. The problem is, snarky comments about history aside, it's a discipline, it's training. It's why the scientific method takes so long with kids. Uh, and unfortunately, the, his, the, the history and social studies teaching profession has not been training kids to say, or teachers to say, okay, I get the story and I get what they were thinking, but I know there's one more thing to do, which is explain how the conditions might have changed that might account for the fact that we get revolutions when and where they do, but not always. Why we get colonization movements when and where we do, but not always, and not in all places. Why Western, why Atlantic Europe and not China? Why this century, but not another century? Those are all the questions that actually give us the lessons of history that allow us to say meaningful things like, we live in a dangerous time, or we actually don't live in a dangerous time because can, our conditions are not right for that. In other words, the right, take-home lessons require this question. And, and you uh, touched on this, Gary, and, and since this is you know your question that you you uh, <laughs> you brought to him, um, you know th this question three in particular seems equally important real, to grasping a good understanding of current events, um, you know, just as much as historical events. Theoretically, I guess most people on the surface would think that would be easier to do. Um, however, I'm not really convinced that it typically works that way. I don't think um, you know people are typically good at applying this thinking to what's happening in the world right now, putting it in historical context or a cultural context or otherwise, and understanding why is this happening? What led to this? You know, in, in particular, thinking about you know, how, how do we need to get better at applying this thinking to what's happening in our current moment in history, you know, in general, not, not specifically anything that's happening right now, but, um, you know, with respect to the way it would be thought of studying history versus studying studying the now and it, 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 there are two things there one is that it, it's much more difficult to apply question three thinking to current events because we just know a lot less right like if you think about sort of underlying context and conditions as sort of the the ocean that we're swimming in right that the current might shift and we're not aware of it because we're in the current Right. And, and we don't, we don't see it happening. So that's one of the challenges, but there are ways to try to overcome that. And, and, but really what you're doing when you're answering question three is you're trying to build a model, right? You're trying to build an intellectual model that says, well, we notice that revolutions tend to happen when these conditions exist, right? When we have, um, an elite group, uh, that feels disappointed or frustrated in their ambitions. Um, when we have uh, a government that's, you know, highly indebted and unable to provide basic services, right? So we can build these models and then try to apply them. And if we, you know, build them over and over again and, and or see that they apply over and over again, we get more fidelity. You know, you can also see this. My favorite example of this is actually um, World War I and World War II. You know, at the end of World War I, the United States picked up its marbles and went home. We didn't uh, involve ourselves with Europe. We made everybody pay back all the money. And then we ended up in World War II. At the end of World War II, American policymakers said, you know, I think that model we used last time was bad. Let's try a different model, right? What if we stay engaged and give everyone lots of money? And, you know, that worked better, right? right. So, you know, that's an example of, of question three thinking. So question four is what do we think about that? Right. So this is, uh, we call it the judgment phase. And, and really, you know, for the students studying these things, considering you know, what is our evaluation of it? How would we, where would we stand? And how would we, you know, uh, so, you know, this is really important as far as that critical thinking piece in particular uh, of, uh, you know, when you talk about the need that history teachers have to teach content and thinking skills, right? That understanding history is not just about knowing the facts, but it's about knowing how do we evaluate it. One of the things that interests me is, how are you able to push students, I guess, to be honest with this one and to really um, engage 
deeply with it to, you know, as you mentioned before, factors, not actors, right? There's a lot of environmental things happening. There's the, the common opinion, what most people are doing. And many years later, you know, most of us, the easy thing to say is, well, if I was there, I would have thought this or that because that's what we think now, but it's not necessarily that easy. And it's also not about trying to, uh, you know, make anyone feel bad. Oh, well, if you were back then, you would have been on the bad side. But to just really be honest about understanding based on what we know now, what we knew then, you know, what what might I have thought? Where might I have been? Um, which is critical to really understanding why things were the way they were. But um, how do you, you know, how do you bring this in in a way that really has students just, you know, really engage critically in an honest way? So we, we learned a lot uh, writing the book this past year. And I, th I would say we learned the most about how to teach question three and question four. Questions three and four are generalizing questions. They're, they're the take home questions. You look at the old essential question, uh, the good ones always look like questions three and question four. Um, and question three, the generalizing feature is obvious. You want a model that you can test in other times and places. You want to know what's going to happen next, right? And as you pointed out, very complicated, very uncertain. Question four is the same way. You put yourself in a situation where I have proclaimed, give me liberty or give me death. And that's an exercise to know under what conditions might you say something like that. So we're preparing for the future by studying the past. And the, the trick to it, the, the thing that we discovered writing the book that we didn't know in the procedure was that you actually have to, uh, so our procedure for that uh, is you brainstorm first. You have to generate lots of claims. You have to, of course you're gonna have gut reactions. You need to spill all the gut reactions. And you need to direct students not to hide from the gut reactions. They might say, well, what they were thinking was this. I know, we did that, that's question two. What's your gut on this? And you spill your guts on give me liberty or give me death. Everything from it's horrifying to it's liberating and in between. Then the key move, the insight moment for us was, now we do question two again on ourselves. We make ourselves the subjects and what we just shared with each other, and that's why it's we, by the way, not I, what we just shared with each other, which we're putting up on the board or on big paper or wherever it is, in the air too, what do those people, what do we believe about the world? What values are expressed implicitly and explicitly in what we just said about Patrick Henry? What's, what's in our minds? And that moment is liberating because what it does is allows you to get enough distance from your own thinking to begin to make choices and to say, wow, it sounds like I'm kind of a hard liner there, you know, but would I be the kind of person who could compromise? And aren't there some things that really require compromise? And aren't the slogans a little rough for actual real life when we test them out in specific cases? And the point is to get perspective so that you can also say, well, that's what everyone says, but I don't know. Everyone seems to be assuming that everything's going to get better no matter what. There are no bad revolutions. I'm not sure about that. So that move to look at what we believe and that do the question to operation of unpacking the assumptions and all that business allows you to then enter the general moment and say, okay, let me try to make a rule for myself that I can actually live with. And let me test it out of my peers. Under these conditions, I'm willing to risk death. But it turns out they're very few and they're very specific. And so that, that just articulating those steps and creating the rubrics and the work and the, the templates that help teachers to help students to wor work through those steps slowly and actually arrive at generalized maxims, you know, rules of action. That was a big, that was like number one product of last year in terms of thinking. We figured that out. Yeah. You know, and, and the, the other thing to keep in mind there is that the goal at the end of a question four class is not that everyone in the room agrees on our principles and maxims and, and plans of action and generalizable statements. That's not at all the, the goal. The goal is that we understand each other mm -hmm. so that Gary thinks Patrick Henry is a hero. I think he was a brash loudmouth. Okay, what is Gary assuming that leads him to conclude that Patrick Henry was a hero? And what am I assuming that leads me to conclude he was a brash loudmouth? Oh, okay. I think Gary's wrong, but I understand why he thinks that. And if I were to accept his premises, well, then I would think that too, right? And so we can easily, you know, not easily, we can make clear to kids that, you know, 
we're discussing as a classroom community here. What do we think about this? And, and we're expecting disagreement, what, but our goal is understanding. You know, I mean, another thing is just as simple as like, you have to have a good question for, right? What do we think about, you know, what do we think about slavery? Okay, it's wrong. Okay? We're, you know, we're not putting that on the table. Right? Um, so that's, you know, not a particularly interesting question for, but if you frame your question well, um, you can move to these really deep and thoughtful discussions with young people about, wait a minute, what matters? What what are, actually do we value as individuals living in a society? Right? And it, it becomes very, very rich. Yeah. I, I actually, I did one yesterday. And, and when you're studying pre-modern societies, it can be a little trickier um, because there aren't a lot of decisions that look, you know, that, that uh, look so controversial. You know, I did one uh, yesterday about uh, the Mongolian government has a 131 foot high stainless steel statue of Chinggis Khan. Uh, at a visitor center outside the capital city of Ulaanbaatar. Should Chinggis Khan get a statue like that? <laughs> um, on the one hand, yeah, he created a giant empire. On the other hand, his highest pleasure was in destroying his enemies. And, you know, and so, so that gets us to an interesting question. Well, who gets a statue? Who should get a statue and why? And so the thing that's, uh, well, one thing that stands out about this approach is how it really helps to make history relevant in a useful way to say like you know history repeats itself that you know maxim but the fact is that things that happened before are going to inform us on things that are going to happen again or are happening now and you're really using it to prepare students for the future to be positive contributors that create good history that make good decisions that you know there's you know that of course the old saying like the his history is written by the winners but that it's not just about predicting who the winner is going to be or or lo looking back and seeing, well, you know, we know this side won, so they must have been the good and this must have been the, the, the wrong side, but also understanding what our what are our values, um, what do we believe in, what would we like to see happen, and finding that balance between what are the trends of time, what are the tides, what are the, the currents that perhaps are, you know, are happening no matter what, what are the other things that are still up in the air? <laughs> what are the things that we believe in and would like to see? How do we, you know, how do we make a good use of our time on the earth? So, I mean, that's, you know, yeah. very, but, but it's like, you know, there's certain things that I think, you know, when, when people don't understand this, they spend a lot of time fighting the wrong battles, so to speak, against, okay, well, this thing is happening no matter what, but this over here, I can really make a difference. And I really have a strong belief in this. So I should spend my time really advocating for this thing or make this decision or, or help with, you know, whatever. And that's all, you know, that's all the things that we talk about this a lot in math, but, you know, just as much in history, you can say like, well, okay, this is interesting. You know, I, this is, I like I like this stuff. I like to read history books or whatever. But you know, what does it really what does it really mean now? Right. Um, and your approach is about saying, well, here's what it means. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, let me just pick up on two things you said there, Ross. One is that you know your your last and and largest point there is that look, the we're not everyone's going to be a historian. Everyone's going to be a person. They're all going to be citizens. And and so really. You know, the reason we study history at all is for the reason that you laid out, that there, there's wisdom in the past if we can figure out, you know, how to think responsibly about it. But I do also want to pick up on one thing you said and, and be really clear. You, you, you said we want um, to help people make good decisions. Yeah, that's true, but good doesn't necessarily mean like, you know, uh, a decision that I would agree with <laughs> and, and that, you know, our, our approach is not aimed at helping kids to vote one way or the other, to analyze things and, ar and arrive at one conclusion or another. Our approach is designed at helping people see how they should think responsibly uh, about history and social sciences so that they can make, you know, what we might say is an informed and thoughtful decision, even if it's one that I personally might might not make and and might strongly disagree with right but that if you are able to think clearly through the examples of the past and see how they might or might not apply and think clearly about your own beliefs and values 
that that's our goal. Yeah, absolutely. So the final thing is, as we wrap up here, you know, we've touched on this before, but you know, your your four questions are, uh, you know, it's a very efficient and I think elegant approach. Is there anything that you had to decide to leave out. Right? Uh, I think there's a lot of questions that history teachers probably use in class often, and it doesn't mean they're not good questions, but but you had to say, okay, we, we need to get down to a model that is concise and really hits on the key points and gets us through this. I mean, is there anything that as you work through your approach over the past you know many years, you you know initially was something you really we're utilizing a lot and you decided, you know what, actually that we have a better way or or just anything that it was like, this is good, but it's not it's not the core four. You know, anything like that that might help other, you know, educators who are who are thinking about how they're going to refine their approach. Because of course every teacher is challenged with uh, maybe one thing more than any other is time, right? We only have so much time to teach what we want to teach to have students learn it. Um, and so having a really, you know, to the point approach is uh, is a helpful way to do that. Yeah, well, we're categorically opposed to five or three, so it had to be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> uh, we we used to tell our clients we did workshops. We'd say we believe we, there wait, were wait, four we, only. We, we still do workshops when we do workshops. We're in the present we're tense. We're doing workshops <laughs> when we do workshops. We but we didn't. We don't say this anymore. Actually, oh. uh, this is how we argue. This is how we talk. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> In the old days when we did workshops, we'd say to people, we believe that these are the four questions that successful history and social studies teachers ask kids to answer in their classrooms. If you're not asking one of these four, if you can't figure out that what you're asking is one of these four, you're probably not asking a clear question. You're probably asking an ambiguous question or frankly, an uninteresting one. Uh, mostly it's ambiguous questions. Uh, but we would say, if you invent a fifth question, we'll name it after you and include it in the method. And then there was one smart Alec type guy at a workshop, a client we worked with for some time, who came up with question five. And we purposely excluded it. Here's question five. Why are these the stories we tell? And sometimes people think of this as the significance question. And the reason we excluded it is because it's actually a graduation requirement. It's really good when kids know a lot of stuff. In order to entertain that question with fidelity to take it seriously in the classroom, you need to know a lot of stories. <laughs> it's, it's really the school committee question, or really it's the national question. Why is this the curriculum we want young people in our society to know, right? And it's good to ask your kids that, you know, ask a 14-year-old or a 12-year-old or an 8-year-old, what do you think it's important to know about your country? But you have to remember, they don't... <laughs> They don't know much yet. They're not equipped to actually answer the question because it takes an awful lot of knowledge to get there. So what, what the piece we came to with this is if teachers and students did the four question method with fidelity, they would be ready by graduation to have a very good discussion about question five. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's, so we now call that question five, but, you know, as Gary said, we deliberately excluded it from the book because that's not a question most ground level teachers are actually going to have to uh, entertain. You know, you're teaching your classes, you've got, you know, X school days, you've got Y hours in the week, you've got to prep your lessons and get stuff done. Like, you, like, well, and yeah. you've got a, you've got a district and you've got a state and, you know, you've got guidance. The fact is this is a public decision, not a school decision. Right. Right. Yeah. Question five is a, uh, it's a great question for, districts to ask themselves annually yes, right? exactly. <laughs> to say exactly. why you know what is uh, are do we still have the right curriculum do we need exactly. another day? what has happened between then and now well so thank you so much john and gary for joining author chats listeners make sure to check out the reflection questions in the show notes to consider how these ideas apply to your practice and you can also learn more about john and gary's book from story to judgment and how to buy it from john cat educational 